because this is going to be a very complex and detailed account of intersectionality. Uh, what you've been seeing or what you should have received are a set of syllabi. Syllabi are basically our course guides in college, so you'll get those when you take courses. If you're going to continue taking courses or taking the sessions that I'm outlining uh, in intersectionality or in feminism or in you know, radical black thought, you have to do all the readings because the lectures are going to be summarizations of those articles. Does that make sense to everybody? So those are your class assignments. <coughs> That's what's due if you come to the lecture on that day. The, se the, se the sessions are built sequentially, so they're going to build on each other. If you don't take the first, if you, if you want to come on three, but you haven't taken the first two, it's not going to make sense, okay? So you need to deal with them in those kind of thematic ways. So what's going to happen today is I'm going to give you basically what scholars give when they give papers. And what's going to happen after that is we're going to have a discussion about what the paper's about. So you want to try to take notes as best as you can while I'm giving the paper. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So and we'll take all the questions at the end. So intersectionality has emerged as the most visible and widely accepted idealist theory emerging on critical race theory at the close of the 20th and dawn of the 21st century. Most of you know intersectionality as a theory is coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, most specifically, her article, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Now, in that essay, Crenshaw is specifically concerned with black women's experience of discrimination. A very important point. So while intersectionality may be claimed today, and we'll have this discussion a little later in Q&A, to apply to multiple groups, initially it was conceptualized on the experiences of black women, specifically under Title VII. She argues that, quote, Black women sometimes experience discrimination in ways similar to white women's experience. Sometimes they share experiences very similar with black men, yet they often experience double discrimination, the combined effects and practices which discriminate on the basis of race, on the basis of sex, and sometimes they experience discrimination as black women, not the sum of race and sex discrimination, but as black women. Now these two differences are, are captured under the terms of additive and interactive. In the first case, where black women experience race plus sex discrimination, is called the additive formulation of intersectionality. The interactive frame of intersectionality, which differs from the additive, is the latter part, where she says sometimes they simply experience the world as black women, a unique form of oppression. In her subsequent article, Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color, which was written two years after her introduction of intersectionality as an analytic concept, Crenshaw attempted to expand intersectionality as a method particular to black women um, to one peculiar to the experiences and history of women of color generally. So whereas Crenshaw's first article on demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex argued for an experimental, experiential and epistemological foundation of race, sex, and the body of black woman as a protected class within the law, Crenshaw's second article maintained, quote, the focus on the intersections of race and gender only highlights the need to account for multiple grounds of identity when considering how the social world is constructed, end quote. So in that first case, in the first article, she was about black women, gave you two accounts, one additive, one interactive. In the second article, she's trying to expand the theory more generally to women of color, saying that any time we look at a situation, we need to look at the various intersections of the condition, race, class, gender, etc. Make sense to everybody? Y'all still with me? Yes, good. Okay. It is important to note that Crenshaw understands the social world, very important distinction here, as a coalitional and political mandate about how one accomplishes a progressive activism as articulated in Mary Masuda's Beside My Sister, Facing the Enemy, Legal Theory Out of Coalition. Under Masuda's formulation of progressive politics, there is a political need for unity, since in unity there is strength, a need to focus on multiple oppressions highlighted by overlapping identities and the acknowledgement that, quote, racism is best understood and fought with knowledge gained from the broader anti-subordination struggle, a call for the end of the reign of the race man, end quote. Now, Crenshaw articulates two kinds of intersectionality in mapping the margins. The first is a structural intersectionality that considers the material effects of various social stratifications, 
which for the purposes of her thinking about domestic violence was poverty and women of color's access to shelters. So on the one hand, you have structural intersectionality, right? The second notion of intersectionality that she talks about is political intersectionality. And political intersectionality highlights the fact that women of color are situated within at least two subordinated groups that frequently pursue conflicting political agendas. The need to split, one, split one's political energies between the two sometimes opposing groups is a dimension of intersectional disempowerment that men of color and white women seldom confront. So you see in the second article when she's trying to make it general, she's giving you a few assumptions. First, the social world or the political world is one of coalitions. Second, racism is best understood within a larger scope of multiple intersecting identities and oppression, which she calls anti subordination or which Masuda calls anti subordination Third, there are two kinds of intersectionality. One is structural, which is dealing with material things like poverty or access to shelters, and the next one is political, which is dealing with the, her account of, of identity and how one's identity or membership in certain groups conflict. So in philosophy, or theoretically, the structural or sociological elements of intersectionality are not emphasized to the extent of the epistemological or experiential. So for example, in the introduction to why race and gender still matter in intersectional analysis, Namata Goswami, Goswami, no, it doesn't be bad because I mispronounced her name. I actually know Namata. I was a schooler. Uh, Mabel Donovan and Liz Hume argue that intersectionality is transformative methodology that captures not just the static outcomes of the problem it brings into view, but its dynamics and lines of force as well. Intersectionality is marked by a kind of flexibility that attends to particularity while resisting definitional categorization. Inspired by Sumi Cho, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Leslie McCall's toward a field of intersectionality studies theory, applications, and praxis, the authors conclude, and I want you to listen to this, that intersectionality is best framed as an analytic sensibility. If intersectionality is an analytic disposition, a way of thinking about and conducting analysis, then what makes an analysis intersectional is not its use of the term intersectionality, but it's being situated in a familiar genealogy, nor it's drawing on lists of standard citations. Rather, what makes an analysis intersectional, whatever terms it deploys, whatever its iteration, whatever its field or discipline, is its adoption of an intersectional way of thinking about the problem of sameness and difference in its relation to, problem, to, to power. I think that's kind of tautological. But this framing, conceiving of categories not as distinct but always permeated by other categories, fluid and changing, always in the process of creating and being created by dynamics of power, emphasizes what intersectionality does rather than what intersectionality is. So the emphasis on change and fluidity, however, has not had an effect on the social marginalization thought to have contributed to the standpoint of epistemology of black women at the intersection of race and gender. Stated differently, basically intersectionality has been created, interpreted, whatever we want to say, is an analytic disposition. Uh, in a recent piece uh, that was published by Patricia Hill Collins and Sarah Blige, she talks about it almost as an attitude towards viewing the world. Okay? So in these terms, intersectionality is not an empirical doctrine. It is simply an interpretive mechanism. It is built on the back of certain political assumptions. So the idea that black women have been excluded from the dominant movements in civil rights era, namely black nationalism and white feminism, has not been offered so much as a historiographic intervention in how we interpret this particular moment in history, but as history itself, an unchanging political dynamic between black men and black women from the 1800s to present. In short, intersectionality has come to mean not only the experiences of black women primarily due to race and gender intersecting, but also carries with it a view of history itself which maintains that black women have always endured political exclusion by the separating of race and gender politically throughout the centuries. And I'll take up the criticisms of this in a different session, but that is the base assumption that this theory is working with. So let's move on to Patricia Hill Collins' view of intersectionality. Patricia Hill Collins' black feminist thought, knowledge, consciousness, and the politics of empowerment has similarly been read as holding <coughs> the position that intersectionality the multiple marginalizations of black women, gifts black women with a specific epistemological faculty from which to view and understand the world. Throughout Collins' text, subordination of black women within dominant discourses and modes of thought is a primary concern. Intersectionality, then, is thought of as a liberatory project, 
one that empowers women against being objects of positive science. What that means is, I'm a, I'm a white social scientist, or I'm a social scientist, I go study black women as a population, and then I use other theories to talk about their experience, right? But definers of their own reality. So then how, what would happen if, say, you use uh, Monaghan's matriarchal thesis to say that because women were single mothers, that black culture was pathological, versus listening to black women, and they explain the conditions of why they're single mothers. Incarceration, poverty, death, etc. Right? You have two different views if you do take those two different approaches. Toward this effect, Collins argues, quote, black feminist knowledge and the traversal politics that might guide black women's activism share important features. Both rely on paradigms of intersectionality to conceptualize intersecting oppressions and group behavior in resisting them. Here we see the closeness and sympathy Collins has for Crenshaw's initial theorization of intersectionality in her first work. This closeness and overlap of ideas, however, should not be seen as synonymous. While there is a tendency to conflate Collins' view of standpoint epistemology with intersectionality, Collins ultimately claims this was a misreading of black feminist thought. So why is this important? Patricia Hill Collins makes the argument that black women have experiences and then black feminist theorists have to interpret those experiences into theory. That is a very, very important segue. Collins is not arguing that black women have experiences, hence experience is true. Collins is arguing black women have experiences and black feminist theorists or scholars have to look into those experiences to transform themes and similarities into theories. Make sense? And look, here's a quote to support that interpretation. Collins argues, and this is a footnote, but, but you have to read footnotes in books too. Okay, so when you read a book, read the footnotes. In Fighting Words, Collins argues that intersectionality should be more substantial and empirically based. She says, quote, standpoint theory alone cannot explain black women's experiences. Despite the overtly claimed and clearly stated eclecticism of my own work, I remain amazed at repeated efforts to categorize my ideas in one theoretical framework or another, generally without full knowledge of the scope of my work. I interpret this pressure to classify works in this fashion as a shortcut way of analyzing social phenomena. Grounded in circular reasoning, one identifies what one perceives as the essence of one approach, classifies thinkers and or their works on those categories, and then accepts or rejects ideas based on one's initial classification. Collins' worry is that the experiential and individualistic focus of intersectionality to justify narrow identity politics that fail to capture the actual reality and conditions and structural realities of black women is prevalent. Collins recognizes the difference between the types of projects that utilize her work to show that intersectionality is synonymous to black women's viewing of the world and her work. She says, quote, a considerable portion of black intellectual productions in academia which come from women in the humanities, where individual narratives and subjective elements for human experience are typically elevated about the types of social structural concerns which I argue for. So Collins reads intersectionality as an articulation of how, quote, African-American women's group history and location can be seen as points of convergence with structural, hierarchical, and changing power relations. So intersectionality analyzes analyses that are used to reify the positionality of individuals, then offer a surface validity in explaining everyday life. So while intersectionality can be used to analyze individual comparisons between individuals like black women to a white woman and how they construct personal identity, Valorizing individualism to the point where group and structural analysis remain relegated to the black ground has close ties to American liberalism. And I would personally add neoliberalism because these individual identities become a peculiar currency for power. Now, Collins argues, so Collins thereby concludes, that intersectionality when applied to the individual level can coexist quite nicely with both traditional liberalism and a seemingly apolitical postmodernism. But such compatibility ultimately reproduces social inequality and state co-optation of marginalized individuals, consequently making oppression worse. So Collins' concern was one of the many theorized and developed by post-intersectionality theories, which we'll talk about later, as a response to some of the identity politics that, become, that have become synonymous with Kimberly Crenshaw's work. Now it's important. Patricia Hill Collins' view as a sociologist is more historical, and here's what I mean by that. 
even though, again, she puts this in footnotes, um, Patricia Collins admits that there were proto-intersectionality theories introduced by black female social scientists before the turn of the 1980s. So Collins specifically references the work of Joyce Ladner, Tomorrow's Tomorrow, the Francis Roger Rose's the black, uh, the black Woman, which was published by Saved in 1980, and both of these methods were calling for the decolonization of white methodological assumptions and highlights the importance of utilizing political economic analysis and descriptions of black gender and sexuality. Collins, however, suggests that it was the focus of gender and race relations in the 60s and 70s that generated this research. The problem, however, is when you read someone like Joyce Ladner or LaFrancis Roger Rose, they're heavily influenced by black men like W.E.B. Du Bois. What do I mean by saying this? Kimberly Crenshaw's view of intersectionality has been taken to mean one thing, right? She's claimed it's more complex, but generally when we speak about it, we're talking about black women. Patricia Hill Collins, as a sociologist, is interested more in matrices of domination, matrices of power, how certain sociological phenomena can be tested or bared out by what black women experience and how the experience of black women point out these intersections, or certain kinds of dynamics. Now, while we tend to think of intersectionality as a black feminist theory, and again, I'll talk about this more in other sessions, uh, Collins admits that there were proto-intersectionality theories that were not feminists. LaFrancis Roger Rose and Joyce Ladner are not black feminists. Womanists, maybe. Afrocentric, maybe. Not feminists. Maybe Neil Marx is giving their class analysis. So it suggests that the antecedent to intersectional analysis, at least in sociology, also has remnants in both black male production and generally how black people viewed race and class previous to the birth of intersectionality. Now, a third intersectional theory. This is called intersectional invisibility. You can put this in quotes. So, or just highlight this term. Uh, they explain the power of social dominance orientations. <coughs> Shorthand for that is SDO. You'll learn about that later in the week. Caused a reformulation of intersectional mode of analyses in the mid 2000s by moving social scientists away from additive and interactive explanations of black female disadvantage towards notions of invisibility. What do I mean by that? The additive approach of intersectionality initially concluded that because, or initially maintained, that because black women experienced the effects of racism and sexism, that they were more oppressed. Right? Once you test that, that ended up being false. Right? Social dominance theory, 1999, tests these incidences, shows that black women within the specific groups, employment, education, incarceration, life expectancy, uh, I think they do housing discrimination, car loan discrimination, have an advantage over their male counterparts. So that part was checked out, right? Um, interactive, the idea that black women have this unique experience of being black women, <coughs> and that this interacts differently in different relations. They tested that, didn't work, right? So intersection and visibility, according to Valerie Purdy Vaughns and Richard P. Akbar, uh, was introduced as a way to reinterpret the findings of social dominance theory. So I'm going to go through what these scholars maintain. Purdy and Ibach begin by acknowledging that intersectionality has traditionally sought to legitimate the double jeopardy thesis, or the idea that minority women suffered the effects of both gender oppression and racial oppression in the United States. <coughs> Over time, this expanded to include class and sexual orientation, but revolved around the idea that multiple subordinate identities, the increased markers of non-prototypicality, would in fact indicate lower social standings to other groups. So intersectionality has a view that the more subordinate identities that one maintains, the more marginalized or oppressed those people would be within certain social stratifications or certain social strata. Historically, intersectionality has appealed to two models of multiple subordinate groups disadvantaged. The first, as I mentioned, was additive, or the view that, quote, a person with two or more intersected identities experienced the distinctive forms of oppression associated with each of his or her subordinate identities summed together. The more devalued identities a person has, the more cumulative disadvantage he or she faces. The second is the interactive model, which suggests that each person's subordinate identities interact in a synergistic way. People experience these identities as one and thus contend with discrimination as multiply marginalized others. 
Purdue and Abach ultimately suggest that the additive and interactive models of intersectionality aim to predict a concrete social, sociological fact that, quote, people with multiple subordinate identities will be subjected to more prejudice and discrimination than those with a single subordinate identity. The double jeopardy thesis is typically supported by findings demonstrating that on many economic and social indicators such as wage, job authority, occupational status, people with intersecting subordinate identities, black women, Latinas, and some groups of Asian American women are at the bottom, falling below white women and ethnic minority men. So everyone gets the contention of intersectionality, right? Or what its general theme is. That given that women is, woman is a subordinate identity, and it is complicated by race, class, sexual orientation, etc., that this would somehow mean a sociological fact. Okay? <coughs> While some authors like Devin Carbato are adamant that, quotes, black women do not experience double jeopardy in every context, and there are contexts in which black men do, his view has not reformulated the popular understanding of intersectionality held <coughs> by most theorists. But Carbato's account presumes non-prototypical masculinity. So in other words, he is speaking specifically about gay black men, right, as a way that they have this other subordinate identity of masculinity, which differ because of sexual orientation. He does not believe that heterosexual black men, who have historically been framed as the biggest threats to white endogamy, which is basically their ability to marry each other, are oppressed due to sex and ways or comfort to other groups, and we'll talk about that in the next session. So what do they mean by intersexual invisibility? This is an important definition. Purdy, Hughes, and Ibach mean, quote, the general failure to fully recognize people with intersecting identities as members of their constituent groups. Intersectionality, intersectional invisibility also refers to the distortion of the intersectional person's characteristics in order to fit them into frameworks defined by prototypes of constituent identity groups. So that means what happens when you have to, you have a view of woman, but you try to put black woman in it. You have a view of homosexual, but you try to put black homosexual within it, right? Those are going to distort the frames because they're based on certain groups. So while subordinate males, well, I'll skip that part because we'll save that later. So basically what Purdy and Hughes argue is that recognition becomes the constitutive basis of how we view oppression. Stated differently, in responding to social dominance orientation, which argues that racialized slash subordinate males are the greatest victims of lethal violence under capitalist patriarchal societies. Intersectional invisibility will argue that the problem is, while it is true that black men are subordinate men are killed more under patriarchy than women, the issue is one of recognition. Does that make sense? I'm going to explain this for you. Purdy and Hughes admit that the data amassed by Sedanius and Prado, and you'll see this when we read their work, show that subordinate males across the world experience greater job discrimination, that black men in the United States report greater discrimination over 30-day periods, and subordinate males endure more retail discrimination than their female counterparts. They admit, quote, that this offers strong support for social dominance theory's prediction that prejudice against arbitrary set subordinate groups is largely targeted at men within those groups which often causes minority men to be worse off overall than minority women. So contrary to both conventional wisdom and the double jeopardy hypothesis, double jeopardy hypothesis, it is racialized men that end up being killed, discriminated than women. But they're going to reinterpret this. So remember, this is the point of intersexual visibility. So to justify a new model of intersexual disadvantage, given the weight of previous evidence, they argue for a shift away from the sociological disadvantage of various historical, cultural, legal, and politically marginalized groups within multiple supporting group identities suffer under to one of recognition. So by shifting the question to how particular groups are recognized, how visible they are to prototypical groups defined as white, androcentrically as male, and heterocentrically as straight, Purdy Hughes and Ibox suggest that subordinate males, even when they experience greater levels of discrimination, violence, and death, are in fact more privileged by being closer to the identity of the prototypical dominant group male. From this perspective, the authors criticize the subordinate male target hypothesis for naturalizing androcentrism or the tendency to define men as the prototypical exemplars of a given group and women as non-prototypical exemplars of that group. So consequently, 
Male targets are violent, of violence are privileged, even though intersectional visibility sub protects subordinate females from the similar levels of violence. Here's the quote. I want you to pay attention. The oppression of subordinate group men is the product of psychological dispositions that evolved as males competed for resources in human ancestry environment. By contrast, our model of intersexual visibility views the oppression of subordinate group men as a reflection of the general tendency in an androcentric society to view all men, both those of dominant groups and those of subordinate groups, as more important than women. It is this marginalization of women in androcentric society that causes subordinate women to be relatively ignored as direct targets of oppression compared to subordinate, subordinate men. So intersectional, intersectional invisibility maintains that the violence racialized males suffer originates from a place of advantage and similarity to the oppressors rather than difference and subjugation from those groups. So let me state this different because I know some of the term threw you off, right? Here's what they are arguing. They are arguing that in patriarchal capitalistic societies, this is, it has to be capitalistic as well, so this is kind of how they frame the theory. Patriarchs will kill and oppress subordinate males more than women. This is what contradicted the additive and interactive framework of intersectionality initially. So they said, how do we reinterpret this fact? as in line with the subordination of women. The way they did that is to say that because white male patriarchs view other men as threats, then the fact that males, white males, patriarchs, view other men as important means that these men will be targeted. They define that dynamic as male privilege. So even while empirically, subject, subordinate males will be killed, discriminated against more, and occupy all the lowest rings of a society compared to women, intersection of invisibility theory will argue <coughs> that is because of their privilege as men who the patriarch thinks is threatening. They don't think women are threatening because they're women. They don't think women are important because they're women. Hence they attack men, which is part of this patriarchal dynamic. This is what they mean by androcentrism. Okay? This is also the logic you see motivating things like Black Lives Matter and Say Her Name. So even though black men are killed more, black women are killed less, remember the argument's recognition. We don't see these black women, hence they become more erased, more oppressed, etc. So the, this intersectional visibility turns on the idea of recognition. Everybody get that? All right, so let's open it up for questions, because I know you have some. Because, because honestly, because the article, the article, y'all read the article, right? It's in the Dropbox. We don't have a Dropbox. Dropbox. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Timmons, can we fix that? They didn't. They said they didn't have access to the Dropbox. Well, the lab leaders were all supposed to give students access to the materials that you provided. Okay. They were given that access way over. Before camp started. Okay. And uh, we're reminded a day or two ago that for all of your lectures, the students that would be attending needed to have that material. So we will have to reiterate that. Yes. Yes. So this material is in your Dropbox. When you read this article, which I encourage you to do, because you have three, because you have two more sessions in this, if you, you know, uh, if you're going to continue on this track, intersectional visibility creates an advantage. So this quote that I pulled is actually under a subsection. So write this down so when you go to it, you can read it. Called the advantages of intersectional invisibility. <coughs> Let me pull this up to you, for you right now so I can. All right. So this would be page. You'll find this on. Where's the spider page? 382. They will have a 
diagram that explains to you the difference between prototypical subordinate male groups or group members and non-prototypical subordinate group members. And this will be under a section called Advantages of Intersexual Visibility, Eluding Active Forms of Oppression. And I will read this part for you. Intersection, intersectional Visibility's hypothesis is that people who are more, more prototypical subordinate group, group members, and what they mean by prototypical is more like the dominant group, okay? So that would be people who are disadvantaged by, by I say, blackness but male, okay? will be more direct targets of oppression <coughs> compared to people who are less prototypical subordinate member groups. Less prototypical means black and female, right? Because they're not prototypical like the ruling class male. Suggesting revisiting the subordinate male target hypothesis. Findings demonstrating that the greater oppression of subordinate males compared to subordinate females, which has been cited to support the subordinate male target hypothesis, can be reinterpreted as an outcome of the non-prototypicality of subordinate females. For instance, ethnic minority women and white lesbian women by virtue of their non-prototypicality may escape the more active forms of discrimination ethnic minority men and gay men face. So what does that say? Just that the more prototypical would be uh, more oppressed than the less prototypical? Right. Then I have a question. Yes. Um, building off of his question, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't that imply then that recognition would be bad because it would like either A, lead to more oppression or like B, exactly. yes. have like the implications of like masculine women? Exactly, more yes. Um, so then how would you weigh this as like a debate argument? Like, what would be like the links? I, this is just, I think this would be, I think if people actually read articles, this would be a very bad debate argument. Because I think, no, I'm, I'm serious, because if we understood it, you know, and this is, again, this is my criticism of BLM, this is my, cri my criticism of intersectionality. Much of the, many of the discussions we have about them literally become what we feel about them, right? Because remember, certain groups of people think of intersectionality as an attitude, right? A disposition towards analyses that carry with it this kind of coalitional political baggage. So we never get to the actual analytic or assumptions of intersectionality because what we're largely doing is describing things in ways that are talking about our identity politics and the end goals of our, of our coalitional things, right? Uh, if we look at the analysis, then recognition would be a very bad thing because if those groups who are now invisible are recognized, it would make them more, more prototypical or at least treat it more prototypically, right? More like prototypical subordinate groups. Uh, and I, but I want to be fair here. Uh, so really quickly. When they talk about the disadvantages of intersectional invisibility, and this is on page, and I want y'all to read this for yourself, people. <coughs> so when we come to the next, this is on page 383. So everybody go to your lab leader, you tell them you didn't have access, and you need access to take the rest of Curry's lectures. The disadvantages of intersectional invisibility, the systematic distortion of intersectional experience. So this problem is how the disadvantages do not have to do with death or oppression, material facts. They have to deal with more experiential facts. Here's an example. The first one, the, one of the first invisibilities listed as disadvantages is historical invisibility. And they say that the intersectional visibility model predicts that the experiences and historical narratives of people with intersectional identities will tend to be de-emphasized or misrepresented in the mainstream historical record. This is an example of this is called the librarian's dilemma. And here's how it's framed. The librarian must decide whether the book should be shelved in the women's studies section or the African American studies section. If she chooses to shelve the book in the women's studies section, it is unlikely that casual browsers interested in African American studies will come across the book. Alternatively, if she shelves the book in African American studies section, the casual browsers of women's studies are going to miss the book. So either way, the study of African American women's experiences will be missed by a whole group of potential readers. That's one of the disadvantages. Right? So again, this is a theoretical argument about, re about recognition. So in one of the texts that I'm working with, I'm dealing with, you know, I'm, I'm countering this in terms of subordinate males uh, by saying, well, there's the archivist dilemma. That if you literally take black men and put them in the American section or put them in the women's section, they're both seen as contradictions. Right? Like you, because what you're, what you're measuring here is not the actual effects of oppression or discrimination, but how people perceive their own experience. And I think that that's important 
But I don't think that raises to the level of things like, I don't know, genocide. So, then I guess it's like, I mean, like, I'll only think about debate application, but like, as a K, like, if somebody reads an identity politics app that, like, asks for recognition, uh, wouldn't then, like, the invisible, like, wanting, wouldn't you want to advocate a K that would, like, advocate for invisibility of oppression then? Yeah, you could, yes. You, I mean, you certainly could. Um, I understand in terms of, like, the sort of affective intersectionality that's, like, very, touch, like, like feelings-based mm -hmm. and recognition is bad. Why is the intersectionality that was mentioned earlier uh, the one particularly where Patricia experiences Powell. were tied and uh, intersectionality mm -hmm. was argued for with using actual experiences not mm -hmm. to still sort of be salvageable? Uh, I think so. I think that the very, uh, this is my personal opinion, right? Uh, I think that if we're going to talk about intersectionality, then what we're talking about are testing specific groups to see if they're in line with certain assumptions. Uh, and there are people who do this. So there are sociologists like um, Catherine Hornoys, um, uh, Evelyn Simeon, um, Noel Kasnov, Kasnav, I always mispronounce his last name. Uh, he's at U UConn. They, they've, made, they've tested these theories. The problem is that those theories don't <coughs> come back in line with standpoint epistemology. So Catherine Hornoys' work, for instance, argues that black men and women have the exact same views of gender, politics, and linked faith. Uh, are linked fate, and that when you're actually testing for feminist consciousness based on those measures, black men actually come out to be more progressive than black women. Uh, that's the same thing that Evelyn Simeon found in 1994 in her black feminist, uh, black feminist conscience or black feminist politics survey. Uh, so the problem is when you go out and test the ideal standpoint of epistemology, when you test whether or not people's political consciousness, their values are aligned with their intersecting identities, it does not create causality with gender, so that it's, it disproves the initial assumption of color, uh, or at least extended that is not exclusive to just So it's like women. intersectionality needs to be justified by experiences and facts, but those mm -hmm. facts and experiences do not justify intersectionality. Yes. Okay. So it says that we need to justify by facts and experience. You go test facts and experience and refuse the theory. Yes. I see. Or refuse certain parts of the theory. Now, if you're going to use intersectionality as a way to analyze how poor migrant peoples are treated in certain regions and you're testing that, then yeah, if you want to interpret that as an intersectional analysis, fine. Uh, in Sermon Blige's and Patricia O'Connell's new book, that's basically what they do. They say this political movement uh, of, of, of women in Mexico or maybe it was Guatemala or somewhere, somewhere in South America, uh, are doing X, Y, and Z. And look at how they're doing class and doing gender, et cetera. So they're like, this is intersectional. You can do that. That's, people are writing books on that. People do that all the time. But, it's, but intersectionality is not predictive. Because the predictive claims of intersectionality, which are additive, would say that black women experience uh, double oppression or are more oppressed, and interactive, uh, both fail empirical tests. Which is why intersectional visibility was created. So I want you all to understand very clearly. This is the claim of intersectional visibility theorists. These two models that we have have failed empirically. So now, given the way of social dominance orientation, we need to find another way to explain why subordinate males are more materially oppressed and endure more oppression than subordinate females, right? So this intersectional visibility is the response to the failing, in their view, of these other two models. Yes, sir? Uh, so intersectional visibility would say that, does it, do the obvious give like any, I suppose, metric by which we could determine whether, like the physical violence that people face versus misrecognition? Like, is there any way in which we could determine? No, because there are two different registers of, of evaluation. In my, I'll, I'll say my, I'll just kind of lay it on the table. My view is this logic is genocidal. Because in genocides, you have dominant group males, whatever they may be, if they're Nazis, etc., going into groups and killing all battle aged males first. Because those are the people who fight against them, and then they exterminate everybody else. So if I apply such a logic, when I say hypothetically, and I'm not saying that, but I'm saying hypothetically, will we be comfortable saying that? German Nazis, the male German Nazi soldiers, were more prototypically aligned with Jewish men. Do we believe that they share the same kind of advantage? Were Jewish men who were victims of genocide privileged because they were killed first in a genocide? Is anybody comfortable saying that? Would you have to say that by this theory? Yes, by this theory you would have to say That's why I think that is deplorable. I think it's a morally deplorable theory. Because I don't think that we should be saying things like victims of genocide are privileged. Right? I just, I don't fundamentally believe that. Uh, 
And if we take the view, because notice, notice what the theory is saying, right? And again, we'll get to this more when we actually talk about social dominance. The theory is saying, because you're, you're men, and you may be subordinate men, so you're not going to be like white men, but because you're male, that's the major axis here, you are going to be targeted by patriarchs who value you because you're male, you're male, which kill you more. So even though you're killed more, there's no way to ascertain the value of your life because it's all based in male privilege. Thank you for Yes, sir. Um, and Colin's argument is that intersectionality is based on sort of the personal experiences and the narratives of black women and instead of empirical examples that so well, that's not what Collins is saying. Collins is saying Collins is saying that the experiences of black women highlight certain structural inequities. And I think that that is true. Okay. And she criticizes humanities, like the people y'all read, like in Lit Crit and Bell Hooks, who has a degree in like creative writing and literatures and things like that. Those are humanities fields. She's saying that she criticizes those people because it's never just about experience. It has to also be about social organization. Right. So she's saying your experience, so the experience of black women who can't get services for domestic violence is, is highlights the structural pro problem of poverty and racism yeah. right? and sexism, right? But your experience of domestic violence doesn't make all that true. It points out, oh, we need to pay attention to this. You go study and you're like, oh, this group can't get access because of this, 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 and this. So is this kind of like Gordon's argument about decades? Like how yeah. if we only rely on personal experiences or their narratives, mm -hmm. we don't understand how the social structures writ large affect these people? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, if you're... Was, so you but think I think Collins would be a lot of that. I don't, I don't think Collins' view necessarily leads to that. And I think that she was, I think the reason she wrote Fighting Words and she has this long section about how black feminist thought was misinterpreted was because, precisely because she was more careful than just saying standpoint of what black women experience is true. That's what people misinterpret her as saying, right? She's saying the experiences of black women are important because they highlight these other structural and you know, epistemic problems and how we know the group. And that's the work of black feminist theorists to actually go in and study and test and you know, figure out what things are actually going wrong. That's not how we use it in popular discourse. Yeah. Right. In popular discourse, we constantly make the mistake of claiming that you know one black woman's experience means a universal truth about everything. That is not what Colin says. So it needs experience and data. Yeah. You need experience and the way she said you need experiences as to test the social organization. Yeah. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the alternative? Because I, mean, I get that you only have like intersectional invisibility. Mm -hmm. uh, what I don't understand then is like, if invisibility is true, it's not like every group can be invisible because there has to be a visible group in order mm -hmm. for one to be invisible. So, like, what, what is this like? Uh, like, I, I guess what's the practicality of this theory? No, it just re it, it reinterprets a set of facts. And see the. What I'm trying to explain to you is the actual theoretical and factual basis of what y'all what y'all say. So if y'all have y'all been in debate rounds and you like had to debate intersectionality or say her name and all that stuff, right? Yeah, that this is the basis of why they say it. Nine to twenty. I mean, I don't even know how many black women were killed this year. I think it was four. So we're halfway through the year. I just posted data. Like 119 black men have been killed and four or five black women have been killed. And if you start talking about black men, and I was on a panel, this, this happened at Urbana-Champaign, and I, I, actually, I actually was reading this article and trying to explain to people why this logic is wrong. And, you know, the same answer I got, the same response I got was, you're talking about men. I was like, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'm saying that the reason you're saying that argument is because intersectional invisibility has become a hashtag. So what you're saying is, is patriarchal to center men who are the greatest victims because you're erasing or ignoring, you're not recognizing women. I'm saying that creates a schism between the people who are dying the most as the victims of the oppression and the people you claim are not recognized because there is no consequence for non-recognition in this case because it's not if you if you recognize the number of greater men that you ignore the women it's just that there are smaller victims of this particular type of oppression whereas if I said domestic violence I'm looking at 6.6 .6 million women lifetime problems versus 5.1 men I'm not I see both right but you, got, you have to focus resources or causality on generally groups that are most victimized. So this is how we've engaged in a kind of calculus of identity politics that has very little to do with what the articles or what the theories actually say, right? Because the, the, the correct answer is, and he asked me, he's like, well, I have a daughter, so what am I supposed to tell her? Well, basically, she's safer. I'm like, I mean, statistically, numerically, 
she's safer from police violence. There are other things that kill black women, like accidental death, uh, heart disease, cardiac, you know, there's, there are other things that, that affect black women disproportionately, but police homicide and incarceration are not, are not the, the biggest things. You compare them to white women, then they're double. But you compare them in general to the rates of their men, which is the operating schism of gender. Like, call, like if you're like, here are black people, what's the difference between men and women? Right? That's your independent variable. Then that's not, that's not, the, that's not the major problem. So this is the theory. I am not, you know, I did the best to be honest about it. Right? When we get to my work, you'll see, like, why is this all bad? But for this <laughs> session, this is the, the foundations of the theory. Right? If they're all, like, with the intersectional, like, invisibility argument, if there are continuously new and more sort of identities that people can fit under, mm -hmm. how can the theory, like, hold that sort of Because they're going to say all those people are not seen and misunderstood. So the, the argument, the, see, remember, the only disadvantages are, like, historical invisibility, are these the ones they list, cultural invisibility, political invisibility, legal invisibility, right? It's just that, it's that people don't see and I think all these, like all the cases they're giving you, because they're building off of Crenshaw, are all debate. Right? For, so for legal invisibility, you're like, oh, in Title VII jurisprudence, you know, uh, we, did, we didn't know how to combine woman, race, and sex for black women's unique experiences. But yeah, but Title VII also uh, excluded black men as viable candidates of employment, because when they were, the reason they added sex was to give white women a right to sue against black women in employment situations. So I can reinterpret your claim about legal invisibility with actual debates that happened during, during the past of the bill. So what is the impact to being invisible if there can be so many other groups that are seen as that? Nothing. Because, I mean, her argument is that you misunderstand these groups of people. So the impact would have to be something like recognition, need to understand experiences are key. Okay. But remember, but this is what I'm saying, remember, you're... you're the advantage, I mean, because if somebody was running this against me and said that, I would just, I would just read that card, but you're safe, or you don't die as well. Turn. Intersectional visibility, good. Because it literally protects you from patriarchal violence. Right? It protects you from genocide. It protects you from death. It protects you from active discrimination. It protects you from the myth of the rapist. Right? That's all the stuff that social dominance orientation is talking about. So intersectionality, I think, strong suit, if you're making the best case for it as an interpretive frame, is that it uses experiential locations to test or at least point to social structures that we may not have accounts for, right? But at the same time, I mean, I'll give you a really, I'll give you a great example of this. So that's the claim. The work that I do, for instance, uh, is on the rape of young black boys. So we just published, well, it's still in the review. Uh, what, when I was given a paper one day, a young man came to me after the paper and told me that he wanted to talk to me. So we're talking. He's like, I really think what you're saying about female perpetrated violence is true. And he told me this really crushing story about being raped as a child. And I was, I was all messed up about it, right? It really affected me. I told my wife, I was, so I was like, I got to study this, right? Couldn't find any literature. Go back, start writing about this, just like starting to, you know, look at what the statutory rape literature is saying for, for racial boys, found one article. So I go to a conference and I start talking. I mentioned this just in q and It's like, look, this is what I'm interested in, in going through. The black men, another, two black men came to me after, afterwards to talk to me. The black feminists were just like, yeah, this is not a thing. That's just anti-woman, right? Black men talked to me, told me about their early sexual experiences. I got even more depressed and upset. There was no literature. So what I did with a colleague, uh, a black woman, who actually believed me and said, you know what, I think you're right, we should study this. We, we did a we did an anonymous phone survey, had people call in, and we, we created the first study about the rape of black, of black boys which was documented at least in earlier social science literature and in the 1950s as black boys generally lost their virginity between the ages of six and nine, usually to much older adolescent black females. So this is a dynamic in our community that we had no research on in, may, in a, maybe two sentences in the mark of oppression. That could be considered intersectional because it, it took other black men telling me their experiences of, of statutory rape for me to actually be impacted to go study and see if it was true on a larger scale. But because I deal with racialized men, no intersectionality theorist has said, oh, good job, the work you're doing is pointing out how an experience has pointed us to a systemically neglected topic of social organization and culture. In fact, they say the exact opposite, because it's male. So the ways that we think about these politics, right, how, these, how this language is used, is not always up to snuff and in line with the actual theories that are proposed. Right? 
Other questions? That's all I thought I saw hand over here. Nothing? How do you think you would defend intersectionality? Intersectional visibility is just one part, right? There are three iterations. Additive, interactive, intersectional visible. All right? I think interactive intersectionality mm -hmm. might be, I guess to me, the sort of easiest to provide a defense of. Okay. Because if the claim is that, or the, the sort of like attempting to sort of combine your group oppressions is problematic in terms of the genocide example, et cetera, mm -hmm. I think interactive intersectionality does the exact opposite of that okay. and isolates new distinct groups That's fair. in which you can isolate their unique forms of oppression. So, uh, so it was like, I guess like, I don't know if this example works, but like Germans, Jews was the genocide example you gave. Sure. And under traditional intersectionality, you just combine them, they have the same sort of privilege experience. Absurd. Well, that's not traditional. Under intersectional oh, visibility, the, the one example more yeah. Like, absurd, right? Um, however, uh, interactive intersectionality would articulate what is the unique oppression suffered by uh, a German, like, right? Like, yeah, it would have to be the subordinate group. Right. So it would have to be the, the German wouldn't be oppressed in that situation because they're the dominant. So it, it's a it, if the sort if attempting to analyze groups by themselves and the, mm -hmm. and the individual oppressions they suffer is a good thing, mm -hmm. then isolating new distinct groups under interactive intersectionality could also be a good thing. That makes sense. I mean, the inter because the interactive approach basically says so. I mean, we'll use the example of a black woman. The interactive approach says that Brianna is not black plus woman; that she's a unique entity. It's like, you know, when, when, when like, uh, Goku and Vegeta fuse, like, it's a new <laughs> entity, you know? No, seriously, like, that's the best way to think about it. Like, do y'all watch Dragon Ball Z? Yeah. Yes, no? The guys are like, yeah, I get it. No, okay. All right, all right, so in Dragon Ball Z, you have two, two individuals, right, and they're Saiyans. The Saiyans could fuse together to become, like, stronger. So interactive, interactive intersectionality is like the fusion dance, right? It's like you become a new being, Okay. Versus like you're just fighting with like goaltender trunks who they fight together all the time, okay? So that's, that's, that's the biggest difference is that you fuse them together so you have a unique personality, a unique synergistic structure. So you can't understand black women's oppression just as racism plus sexism. There's something specific, and this is what the term misogyny noir tries to get at. There's something specific about being a black woman that has a unique kind of hatred, a unique kind of discrimination, a unique kind of oppression, right? Uh, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent. I don't. I think that the problem I have with these kinds of theories, when they're interpretive, is that they're useful for the groups that want to use them. So, if you're a black feminist scholar, I completely understand why you support intersectionality. I completely understand why it becomes kind of the bedrock of the theory. But when you try to apply it to other groups, it just doesn't work. Because, like, how do I deal with the fact that as these, as, as as every intersectionality theorist has maintained, that there's fundamental male privilege that racialized men experience, when I have to go, by the time I get to this in 2008, I literally have to jump through the mental gymnastic of every empirical example that you come up with where racialized men are supposed to be advantaged, they're actually disadvantaged. And you say, oops, my bad, so let's just interpret all their disadvantages as advantages, because they're, because they're men and patriarchs. I don't like those kind of mental gymnastics. I think if you lose an argument, you lose an argument, you have to build something up. You don't just get to say, my bad, let's reinterpret death, discrimination, genocide as advantages for groups of people. Because we would never do that if it was a, if it was a female group, right? Would we ever say that the death, genocide, rape, and murder of, of women in a patriarchal society is privilege? No. We wouldn't even say that in a matriarchal society. So there's something about the category of male that is operating in these theories that doesn't allow the kinds of empathy uh, you know, for that kind of experience. And when you get to Connell, I'll get you one second. Connell's argument, and uh, R.W.S. Connell, do y'all know who this person is? R.W.S. Have y'all heard Hegemonic Masculinity? Yeah. Connell's the person that created that term. So in Connell's 2002 book uh, on masculinities, she says, she's a trans woman, uh, she says that in patriarchal society, subordinate men are disposable. So in my mind, reading these theories alongside each other, it seems to me that the male category of intersectionality is always predetermined to disposability because in patriarchal societies you need groups of men that will just die for the greater good of the society. And that's why you have men that go out there in the front lines of battle, you have men that do the uh, most dangerous work, you have men who have the work, like working class men have the shortest life expectancy in, the, in their race, right, because of this kind of factor of disposability. Right. Yes ma'am? Uh,
Yes. Yeah. Winter winter would not be an intersectionality theorist because it, because winter would reject the categories that are used to be combined. Right? And you see the same thing with Oyuomi in the invention of woman. Uh, the the anti colonial anti colonial or post colonial theorists uh, like Winter, uh, like Oyuomi, criticize the history that comes along with the sign of gender. So most their argument, uh, specifically the or her argument is specifically the invention of woman, is that the the term gender is said to be cultural and performative, but it's always biologized to mean woman. So when you do that, you don't just say woman; you bring into it a whole history where woman means oppression by men. And this is the problem that Judith Butler saw as well, because she says you have to look at actual context. You can't assume universal oppression, which is what we do every time we talk about gender. Every time we talk about gender, <coughs> right? Because we say, "Oh, woman, oppression," right? And when we start discussing the book, uh, there's a long section, there's a long discussion in there about what, where intersectionality gets this theory. They get it from second wave feminists, specifically the work of Catherine McKinnon. Because that's her definition of gender. Her definition of gender is the distance in the hierarchy that men have over women. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so like in a case of like a transgendered person mm -hmm. who's like operating to like move to the other gender, mm -hmm. would that be them moving from one gender, like escaping like one bad phys like physical outcome to another mm -hmm. in like? Would that be them creating their own intersectionality, or...? Well, it would, under intersection of visibility, or under a different intersection? <coughs> so, like, if, like, there's, like, a black woman who's becoming a male, mm -hmm. would she be, like, going and moving to another dominance, and then under that theory yeah. become privileged, or is she yeah. creating her own intersectionality? No, under, under intersection of visibility, she would be, because basically she's made herself look or be more prototypical to the white patriarch. Okay. Because, so, and this, is what, this is why I think it's so interesting, because if... Given, given, you know, given what's happening with, with, with trans people, you would have to say then that trans women become less subordinate non-prototypical and trans men become subordinate prototypicals. So you would, so they would exist, they would, even if they're killed more, they would now have more, more male privilege. But wouldn't that take away, like, the type of oppression that, like, transgender people face? Yeah, because... Intersectional visibility is is based on a rubric of male, female, subordinate, um, non-prototypical, prototypical groups. So for them, prototypical means male, non-prototypical means female. So if you're working on that sexual axis, that's moving up and down. That's going to define how you're recognized and are killed as threatened in society. Okay, I see. Yeah, and and it's really interesting because like when you read the some of the literature and stories from trans men, they're like, this is not all it was cracked up to be. Like uh, the student from Northwestern. That was like, people are afraid of me now. People don't want to be around me now. People, you know, it's this shock, like, oh, you know, being a black man actually kind of sucks because of the character and constructions of fear, right? So what I think often happens, and this is why I say that, you know, a lot of times when, and I'm not saying this belongs to the theory, I'm saying the way that people interpret it, is, you know, people are saying we shouldn't play the oppression Olympics, but, you know, like black feminists and intersectionality theories are always going for the goal because, is one of these ways where you're, you know, even when you look at this, it's kind of like, you know, well, we shouldn't play the oppression Olympics. We shouldn't know who's more oppressed. But what that does is disarm empiricism. So we, we get to have this debate about black men versus black women, and you get to assert these things like, you know, black women have historically been victims of rape, which they have, right? But so has every other group that's ever been colonized, men, women, children, et cetera, right? You know, uh, black women are victims of domestic abuse. Yeah, but so has every other group. You know, it's... It tries to claim under the gender category a certain causality for violences that are not unique to anyone, right? And that's not that doesn't mean that certain groups don't have you know suffer them more than others, but it's not unique. It doesn't only happen to this group. And so I I just don't see how this framework because of all the baggage of kind of playing this oppression. I don't understand the the, the benefits of the framework. Because when I go study black male victims of domestic abuse or female perpetrators of domestic abuse, nobody's like, oh, that's intersectional. They're like, that's anti-intersection, anti-feminist. Because it, because I am implicating, I am reversing the causality. You know, the idea is that men are perpetrators. I'm saying no females are perpetrators, right? They're like victims are women. I'm saying no males are victims, right? So they don't, because of that, they don't see it methodolo methodologically as intersectionality. They see it as, as violating the kind of ideological or anthropological assumption of male versus female. You know? Uh, so again, that being said, though, 
if you're running intersectionality, I think that you certainly can use experience to get to structure, and I think that you certainly have an argument uh, in terms of the coalitional or political side of it, right? Political intersectionality, how certain groups come together, our intersectionality allows movements that allow things to solve uh, X, Y, and Z. And that is all certainly within the uh, structure of the arguments and, and the literature. So thank you.